Section number seven of Robinson Crusoe in words of one syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Robinson Crusoe in words of one syllable by Lucy Aiken. Section number seven. I had been to milk my goats in the field close by, and when he saw me, he ran to me, and lay down on the ground to show me his thanks. He then put his head on the ground and set my foot on his head, as he had done at first. He took all the means he could think of to let me know that he would serve me all his life, and I gave a sign to show that I thought well of him. The next thing was to think of some name to call him by. I chose that of the sixth day of the week, Friday, as he came to me on that day. I took care not to lose sight of him all that night, and when the sun rose I made signs for him to come to me, that I might give him some clothes, for he wore none. We then went up to the top of the hill to look out for the men, but as we could not see them or their boats, it was clear that they had left the isle. My slave has since told me that they had had a great fight with the tribe that dwelt next to them, and that all those men whom each side took in war were their own by right. My slave's foes had four who fell to their share, of whom he was one. I now set to work to make my man a cap of hare skin, and gave him a goat skin to wear around his waist. It was a great source of pride to him to find that his clothes were as good as my own. At night I kept my guns, sword, and bow close to my side, but there was no need for this, as my slave was, in sooth, most true to me. He did all that he was set to do, with his whole heart in the work, and I knew that he would lay down his life to save mine. What could a man do more than that? And, oh, the joy to have him here to cheer me in this lone isle! I did my best to teach him, so like a child he was, to do and feel all that was right, I found him apt and full of fun, and he took great pains to learn all that I could tell him. Our lives ran on in a calm, smooth way, and but for the vile feasts which were held on the shores, I felt no wish to leave the isle. As my slave had by no means lost his zest for these meals, it struck me that the best way to cure him was to let him taste the flesh of beasts, so I took him with me one day to the wood for some sport. I saw a she-goat in the shade with her two kids. I caught Friday by the arm and made signs to him not to stir, and then shot one of the kids, but the noise of the gun gave the poor man a great shock. He did not see the kid, nor did he know that it was dead. He tore his dress off his breast to feel if there was a wound there. Then he knelt down to me and took hold of my knees to pray of me not to kill him. To show poor Friday that his life was quite safe, I led him by the hand, and told him to fetch the kid. By and by I saw a hawk in the tree, so I bade him look at the gun, the hawk, and the ground, and then I shot the bird. But my poor slave gave still more signs of fear this time than he did at first, for he shook from head to foot. He must have thought that some fiend of death dwelt in the gun. I think that he would have knelt down to it, as well as to me, but he would not so much as touch the gun for some time though he would speak to it when he thought I was not near. Once he told me that what he said to it was to ask it not to kill him. I brought home the bird and made broth of it. Friday was much struck to see me eat salt with it and made a wry face, but I in my turn took some that had no salt with it and made a wry face at that. The next day I gave him a piece of kid's flesh, which I had hung by a string in front of the fire to roast, my plan was to put two poles, one on each side of the fire, and a stick on the top of them to hold the string. When my slave came to taste the flesh, he took the best means to let me know how good he thought it. The next day I set him to beat out and sift some corn. I let him see me make the bread, and he soon did all the work. I felt quite a love for his true warm heart, and he soon learned to talk to me. One day I said, Do the men of your tribe win in fight? He told me with a smile that they did. Well then, said I, how came they to let their foes take you? 
They run one, two, three, and make go in the boat that time. Well, and what do the men do with those they take? Eat them all up. This was not good news for me, but I went on and said, Where do they take them? Go to the next place where they think. Do they come here? Yes, yes, they come here. Come else place too. Have you been here with them twice? Yes, come there. He meant the northwest side of the isle, so to this spot I took him the next day. He knew the place and told me he was there once with a score of men. To let me know this, he put a score of stones all of a row and made me count them. Are not the boats lost on your shore now and then? He said that there was no fear and that no boats were lost. He told me that up a great way by the moon, that is, where the moon then came up, there dwelt a tribe of white men like me, with beards. I felt sure that they must have come from Spain to work the gold mines. I put this to him. Could I go from this isle and join those men? Yes, yes, you may go in two boats. It was hard to see how one man could go in two boats, but what he meant was a boat twice as large as my own. One day I said to my slave, Do you know who made you? But he could not tell at all what these words meant, so I said, Do you know who made the sea, the ground we tread on, the hills, and woods? He said it was Beak, whose home was a great way off, and that he was so old that the sea and the land were not so old as he. If this old man has made all things, why do not all things bow down to him? My slave gave a grave look and said, All things say, Oh, to him. Where do the men in your land go when they die? I'll go to Beak. I then held my hand up to the sky to point to it and said, God dwells there. He made the world and all things in it. The moon and the stars are the work of his hands. God sends the wind and the rain on the earth, and the streams that flow. He hides the face of the sky with clouds, makes the grass to grow for the beasts of the field, and herbs for the use of men. God's love knows no end. When we pray, he draws near to us and hears us. It was a real joy to my poor slave to hear me talk of these things. He sat still for a long time, then gave a sigh, and told me that he would say, Oh, to beak no more, for he was but a short way off, and yet could not hear, till men went up to the hill to speak to him. Did you go up to the hill to speak to him? said I. No, okies go up to beak, not young men's. What do okies say to him? They say, oh. Now that I brought my man Friday to know that beak was not the true god, such was the sense he had of my worth that I had fears lest I should stand in the place of Beak. I did my best to call forth his faith in Christ and make it strong and clear, till at last, thanks be to the Lord, I brought him to the love of him with the whole grasp of his soul. To please my poor slave, I gave him a sketch of my whole life. I told him where I was born and where I spent my days when a child. He was glad to hear tales of the land of my birth and of the trade which we keep up in ships with all parts of the known world. I gave him a knife and a belt which made him dance with joy. One day as we stood on the top of the hill at the east side of the isle, I saw him fix his eyes on the mainland and stand for a long time to gaze at it, then jump and sing and call out to me. What do you see? said I. Oh, joy, said he with a fierce glee in his eyes. Oh, glad, there see my land. Why did he strain his eyes to stare at this land, as if he had a wish to be there? He put fears in my mind which made me feel far less at my ease with him. Thought I, if he should go back to his home, he will think no more of what I have taught him and done for him. He will be sure to tell the rest of his tribe all my ways and come back with, it may be, scores of them, and kill me and then dance round me, as they did round the men, the last time they came on my isle. But these were all false fears, though they found a place in my mind a long while, 
and I was not so kind to him now as I had been. From this time I made it a rule, day by day, to find out if there were grounds for my fears or not. I said, Do you not wish to be once more in your own land? Yes, I'd be much o oh, glad to be at my own land. What would you do there? Would you turn wild and be as you were? No, no, I would tell them to be good, tell them eat bread, corn, milk, no eat man more. Why, they would kill you. No, no, they no kill, they love learn. He then told me that some white men who had come on their shores in a boat had taught them a great deal. Then will you go back to your land with me? He said he could not swim so far, so I told him he should help me to build a boat to go in. Then he said, If you go, I go. I go? Why, they would eat me. No, me make them much love you. End of section 7. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Woodstock, Ontario, Canada.